Podcasting from a secret location, deep inside the political colossus. This is Radio Free GOP, the voice of the Republican resistance. Part of the beauty of me is that I'm very rich. Let me tell you, I'm a really smart guy. What's your name again? John Miller. Oh my God, they've got a madman on their hands. We will have no truth nor folly with you or the grisly gang who work your wicked will. You do your worst and we will do our best. We've come to a turning point, a moment for hard decisions. If not us, who? And if not now, when? It's 1159 at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. This is Radio Free GOP with your host, Mike Murphy. Hello, it is me, Mike Murphy, podcasting here from an unknown location. And the funny thing is, I don't even have a shrink, but I didn't want to hurt the Jingle Singers' feelings. They are good people, and they did a great job for us. You'll be hearing more and more of our radio-free GOP jingles from the golden age of Big Boss Radio. I'm part of the audio signature we're trying to do here. Why? Because it's fun. So, big week in politics. We have Trump stakes, high stakes, not the mail-order former Army horse meat stakes, the real thing, the Veep stakes. Who's he going to pick? Just 24 hours from now, I'm going to speculate a little with absolutely no inside knowledge. I only know what I read in the media, but I have a few guesses, so I'm going to talk about that. We have part two of our Mitt Romney interview where we wrap it up with the, the mega, mega question. question. In other words, Mitt, if it came down to just one vote, your vote, who would you pick? Who gets to be president? We're going to ask Mitt Romney that and talk to him about some other interesting topics like who's going to run in 2020? So stay tuned for another uh, installment of our discussion with Mitt Romney. And we've got the convention coming up. We're packing here at the Radio Free GOP secret underground hideout to prepare for a week in Cleveland. Um, We'll be doing a couple of interviews there. We'll be doing some of that shoe leather reporting for which we're famous. And I'll be pundifying, endless pundifying. I'm looking forward to it. You'll be able to see me uh, every morning of the convention on the Today Show. Uh, where I work as an analyst for NBC, uh, talking to Matt and the gang about what's really going on at the convention. And I'll be around the primetime MSNBC coverage after the convention each night, as well as popping up from time to time on other shows and other media outlets. So I will be busy, and I have to admit we're kind of excited for the podcast because there are going to be a lot of great interview opportunities you'll be hearing over the coming weeks. We have set up our command center. We are in a secret location in the back room of the best dive bar in Cleveland. And we will be libating, watching, interviewing, podcasting, and uh, I think enjoying what should be at least an interesting week for the Republican Party. And then after that, we go to Philadelphia for more of the same. So we're packing up and getting ready to go. But before we get into the Veep stakes and the convention dynamics, and again, our part two of the Mitt Romney interview, I want to talk a minute about the polls. They're everywhere, and the media is a flutter. I can't turn on cable television and not hear people talking about the new poll that means this, that, or the other thing. Most of them show the race between Hillary and uh, Donald is tighter. It's closed. Does that mean Trump is surging? What, What does it mean, and does it predict the future? Because that is the key to summer polling. It is an excellent snapshot of what happened yesterday, but is it predictive? Does it give us any real insight? I'll tell you what it does do. It's a complete gift to the media because it gives them something to talk about where they can ring the red alarm bells on set and act like this is a big lightning bolt and something's really happened in the race. Unfortunately, I think that's a little bit of a scam because while it feeds the chatter, it's not necessarily that predictive. In history, we are in the middle of a period in July That was the heyday of President Mike Dukakis. The pre-convention polling is fun, but it's a bit misleading. So we're going to do a little deep dive into that, and we're going to look at polls that are too early to really mean anything because it's part of a media scam. Sing it. Here's some brand new polling, though it's too soon to know. Radio Free GOP, who gives a damn? It's all a scam. 
Polls, polls, polls everywhere. What does it mean? Eh, it's July pre-convention. I don't think in the real picture it means a lot. But in the inside game, oh, ho, ho, it is a big deal. Brand new poll out this morning. It's Thursday showing a tied race, 40-40 between Clinton and Trump on the front page of the New York Times, the new New York Times CBS poll. This is sort of a big deal for a couple of reasons. One, I guarantee you there are tears of rage at the Clinton campaign and tears of joy at the Trump one. One, Trump's team of yes men doesn't have to wrestle him into a corner with a chair and a whip like a lion with bad polling news like they've had to do over the last couple of weeks. They now have what people interpret as a good poll to show him. Two, those guys are rolling into the convention with problems, and they have a legitimate delegate revolt brewing because I think two-thirds of the floor doesn't want Trump. And part of what fuels that has been the bad polling they've received over the last couple of weeks. Now they can wave a good poll around, including some of these swing state polls. There's a Quinnipiac poll showing them three points ahead, just around the margin of error in Florida. This is all fodder to go to those rebellious delegates or delegates in the middle who don't quite know which way to go in a nasty kind of unrepublican movement like this to upturn a convention and say, look, everything's going fine. We're on track. Relax. Fall into line, which is a powerful message with the good burgers of the Republican Party. So it is a good thing for the Trump folks coming into the convention to have this poll. Now, Here's the question. Does it mean anything? What's really driving it? Well, beyond all the disclaimers I've already talked about with summer polling, when you see a poll that says 40% for Clinton and 40% for Trump, it means both of them are down to their rock-solid vote for a bag of cement with the party label on it voters. It is the polling equivalent of the country projectile vomiting that they want neither of these candidates. Massive 20% undecided. Both are knocked down to their base numbers, which would be very high 30s to 40. Now, in Trump's case, it's because he's Trump. He's offended every swing voter in America, and I don't see a lot of opportunity for him to change that. In the case of Hillary, what we're seeing is what I'll call the FBI effect. This is what happens to your polling numbers when you're described in terms only one click kinder than pretty boy Floyd. So she's taking a beating for the FBI report. He's taking a beating for just being Trump. And the country is retching at the idea. So what will it mean? I think it means a little better convention path for Trump who already has the advantage. It'll give him an argument to make. And you see the same thing in the state polls. Quinnipiac and Marist are good polls. They're competently done. And they show a tied race in Ohio. Both of them agree. They don't agree on every state, these new polls. But they both agree that Ohio is tied. But it's the same deal. Both are sitting in the low 40s. Ohio is a close state to begin with. You don't build a big lead if you're the Republican or the Democrat in Ohio. That's why it's one of the two or three fulcrum states that decide the election. But it does show, again, a big undecided, both candidates with a high and favorable rating, both candidates in trouble. Time will change all this. Presidential campaigns are big, long paintbrushes with major events to change public opinion. You have the conventions, you have the debates, you have advertising, you have a lot going on. This is just the beginning of the beginning. So I wouldn't take it too seriously. I think if I had to give the kind of bottom line, it would be that Trump is stuck where Trump always is, while Hillary is at the low end of her range because of the FBI disaster that she created. So she deserves the polling trouble. The key thing is, if you look at the demography of the undecided voters, the voters that will get either one of these two characters from the 40, 41, 42, up to the 48, 49, or even perhaps if the independent candidates get nothing, 50%, the path forward to actually win the election, those voters look more like Hillary voters than Trump voters. Trump is kind of maxed out. He's running out of oxygen. So a lot of the polling dynamic of this race, and we've seen it in the past, is Hillary falling to the bottom of her range and then getting these dubious voters back who hold their nose and eventually fall in for Hillary because they're more democratic and they are more inclined to be anti-Trump based on the kind of stuff that Trump does every day, which is why I still think Trump's in trouble. And if I were a delegate, I'd vote to get his ass out of there so we don't lose the election. There's going to be pressure. We're in the middle of it. There's high uh, drama going on on the Rules Committee as I record this, and we'll see what happens. The issue is, will they be able to get enough Rules Committee members together, I think in the high 20s, to issue a minority report, which is not only a kind of so-so eh, Tom Cruise movie, it is a device that lets the entire convention, all everybody, 
vote on whether or not to free the delegates to let them do whatever they want. So that's the other high drama going on this week. I think there's a chance the minority report. I think there's a fighting chance it could happen. There's definitely concern in Trump land. This new polling in Ohio and Florida, where there's a poll showing Trump three points ahead, is going to be useful ammunition for the Trump guys in that hand-to-hand fight. Though, again, I hope that the uh, the Rules Committee does the right thing because fundamentally, in the structure of the race, the key demography, and just Trump being Trump, the advantage, despite this polling problem, is still, I'm very sad to say, with Hillary Clinton. So, the convention, on to Cleveland, and part two of our Mitt Romney interview with The Mega Question. But first, you guessed it, we're going to pay some bills. Radio Free GOP! Okay, it's commerce time here. As I've told you before, we have a massive squad of psychic nutritionists, henchmen, technicians, jingle singers, you name it. We have one on the payroll, and they all cost money. So... This is the part where I read an ad, except we don't have any ads yet. Now, I hear from high-placed sources that the executive suites of Madison Avenue are a flutter. Forget the Super Bowl, they're saying. we got to get on this podcast. But legal issues, you know, clerical stuff, vacation days have gotten in the way. Nobody yet, which is too bad, because I still wish there was a way to do postage connected to the dot-com revolution, some way to get rid of this old postage meter here that I pay far too much for. Or better yet, a way to do something about the high cost of razor blades. If only there was a club I could join involved in shaving that I could talk about here to our loyal listener or three or four. Podcast advertisers, scruples, ha, don't worry about it. Send us your copy. We're here and open for business. Now, also, you can help us by two different commercial venues. One, you can buy one of our American Apparel high-quality t-shirts, Featuring the Jack Frost Republican Elephant Upside Down in Distress. We have it in formal navy blue with the white logo or in white with the sporty Republican red ink, red over white version. They're both in pre-order right now because we don't use the slave labor factories of Trump menswear and it takes a little longer, but we should have them in hand and ready to ship out next week. Get yours and now a special offer. I've gotten a couple of emails about, hey Mike, send me one of those cranky bumper stickers you made after the campaign for your friends on the Jeb staff saying, don't blame me. I was for Jeb. I'd like one. Where do I send the money? How do I get one? Well, if you buy a t-shirt, the first 16 people in this special offer, I will throw in free of charge one of those treasured collector's item. Don't blame me. I was for Jeb bumper stickers. They are the rage in the fashionable quarters of Miami, New York City. Supermodels wear these things. They are everywhere, but they're rare. I've got 16 of them left, and I'll throw them in free of charge if you buy a Radio Free GOP t-shirt in either formal blue or rebellious red. Finally, we have an Amazon button on our website. This is kind of an interesting caper. You go to Radio Free GOP. You click the Amazon button, takes you right to Amazon, and you can buy stuff at the normal price, but they give us a tiny little shaving of what it costs to help pay the electric bill around here. So if you're thinking of blowing the kid's college fund on an incredibly stupid and expensive Amazon purchase, click through our button and we get a few shekels here to help pay the electric bill, the yes men, and we know who your favorites are, our great jingle singers down in Dallas. So Help us out, keep us going, and soon, hopefully, we'll have some advertising because I'm tired of paying all the damn bills. Now, onward to Trump's Veep Stakes and part two of our talk with Mitt Romney. Vice Trump. It has a certain ring to it. Somebody's got to take the job. Not many want it. That's why this is a convention you could have a team of bloodhounds and still not find any Republican stars at. You couldn't drag them there with a a team of cat bulldozers. But somebody is going to take this job. So let's take a look at the three big contenders right now, who I think are, based on media reports, I don't have any other insight into it, Governor Chris Christie, Governor Mike Pence of Indiana, and former Republican House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Start with Newt. What's the balance sheet on Newt? On the plus side, provocateur, knows how to inflame the media. He's a more sophisticated bomb thrower in Trump, but in his heart, he's a bomb thrower. And he is a committed conservative. He has, to his credit, been part of the cause for a long time. And I'm a little soft on Newt. Occasionally, he has very innovative policy solutions. Then occasionally, he shows incredibly bad political judgment. Again, right at home in Trump Tower. So 
I think there's kind of a kindred spirit thing going on, but you have to ask yourself if you're Trump, what do you get from Newt? You get a flashy vice presidential debate performance that'll be impressive. You get somebody who's willing to attack the media every day, which will entertain Trump. And you get somebody who can't deliver a single new vote to the ticket. You also have somebody with a bit of the patina of yesteryear, the Washington establishment of the 90s, now running against the Washington establishment of now. That doesn't fit too elegantly. So I think Trump, in my gut, We'll look at Newt as the second choice. Everybody's telling him to pick Mike Pence, the governor of Indiana. Respected governor, was a leader in the House, committed conservative. The convention delegates will love him. He'll sail through as VP. That helps eliminate headaches. It's a reassuring thing to conservatives who suspect, in my view correctly, that Trump is uh, anything but a real conservative or has no real ideological loyalty to the party whatsoever. So Pence brings you a lot. The problem is everybody's telling Trump Pence is the smart choice, which means I don't think Trump will do it. I think Trump likes to ignore advice. And the more guys in suits tell him he should really pick Pence because it makes so much sense, I think he'll do something else. I don't know why Pence is interesting. To me, it seems like a foolish move for him, but he seems to want it. I don't think he brings Trump anything Trump doesn't have other than some conservative cred, which helps Trump with the base. But getting base votes is easy, and it does not win you the election. It is not accretive. But Pence, eh, a little too clever, a little too staff-driven an option, I think. So my gut is Christy. Trump lives for his resentments. Trump wants his enemies punished. You watch Trump, you can see his formula. He flies around in the jet. He watches cable TV, the shows. He lands. He gives a speech to a rowdy crowd, amping up the crowd as much as he can with cheap applause. And he responds to anything that's irritating him in the media cycle. By the way, Donald, please attack at Radio Free GOP. We would appreciate the publicity. So what does Trump want in his heart of hearts? He wants his choice, not anybody else's. And he wants a hammer, somebody to go attack his enemies, somebody to complain about the media, somebody who's bellicose, somebody who's fast on his feet, somebody who's not afraid to bellow a good insult. He is more contemporary than Newt. He is more of a brawler than Pence. And he's somebody Trump has a relationship with. And because all these advisors and super strategists and very, very, very important sources are all saying Pence and all saying Newt, I think Trump will say, screw them all. I'm going with the brawler. I'm going with the gorilla. I want Christie. So do I have any special insight? No, I'm guessing. But I know candidate psychology. And if I had to guess, and if I had to bet, I'd say keep an eye on Chris Christie as Trump's vice president. Will it make a difference? Will it change the election? Absolutely not. Nobody votes for vice presidents anymore. It's not 1888. We don't do regional coalition politics. All a vice president really does, that choice, is create a narrative to tell people about how the presidential candidate thinks. That's why my dear friend John McCain paid a price for Sarah Palin. It became a negative narrative about the most prepared country first guy making what appeared to be a political decision for somebody who was not prepared. In Trump's case, The worst thing Trump could do is pick somebody who's super qualified. Luckily for Trump, nobody would take it. But if Trump had a real superstar vice president, all it would do is diminish Trump. Who's that clown next to the really impressive person? So Trump needs a second banana, a second tier candidate, which is why he's only interested in a few people, let alone the reality that only a few will take it. And I think when in doubt, he'll go for the brawler. And all that'll tell us about Trump is what we already know. He's a brawler. So it won't change anything. It won't enlarge his appeal. It won't do anything for Trump to fix the fatal problem he has with college-educated white women and Latinos who are going to deny him, I believe, in the end, the election. Sadly for uh, the Republican cause, but that's what we get for having a nominee who was designed in a lab to lose. So, total guess. Don't bet a dime on it, but I smell Christie coming. We're knowing 24 hours. And then, off to Cleveland. We'll be there. We'll be podcasting. I'm packing my gas mask. We're going to be doing some great interviews. I'm looking forward to it in a bizarre kind of way because I still, hopeless romantic, am hoping against the odds that that rules committee will bring democracy, small d, to the Republican convention and let the delegates know what is right in their hearts. They have a real decision to make about opening the convention and doing something else. The great philosopher Eric Hoffer, the philosopher of the San Francisco docks, once said that every great cause becomes a movement, then a business and then eventually a racket. Trump, this year at least, will make the Republican Party a racket. And those delegates owe their country and their party something better than that. So if any of you are listening to the podcast, 
Nobody's asking you delegates to land on Anzio Beach and take German incoming machine gun fire. Just to do the right thing and open up the convention so everybody can vote their heart. Because for the rest of your life, you wish you had. And with that, let's go to part two of our interview with my friend, our former nominee, a great American, and somebody who I wish had become president last time, Mitt Romney. It's time to ask some questions and go behind the scenes. Here's our latest interview. We'll try to keep it clean. Radio Free GOP. I remember when I met you, you were running the Olympics. You may not remember this, but I came out there and you and Bob White, your partner in the Bain days and another great American, you and Bob White took me to the Paralympics. Mm -hmm. And I went out there just to pontificate about Senate races, but one thing led to another. And then I wound up working for you to my great delight. You remember the Stevie Wonder story you told me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> you want to tell that? Because that's yeah, a great sure. business story. We contacted Stevie Wonder and asked if he would perform in the opening ceremonies of the Paralympic Games. And the Paralympians, for people that don't know, are athletes that have one disability or another. Some are blind, ski, blind skiers and so forth. And uh, they came back and said, yes, it'll be $500,000 for him to appear. And so we got back to him and said, uh, maybe you don't understand, but this is not just for all athletes. This is for disabled athletes, including blind athletes. So can you give us a special price? And they came back a day later and said, yeah, it'll be $500,000. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, he was worth it. Yeah. He was phenomenal. Yeah. And on the night of the opening ceremonies, we had unexpectedly rain in Salt Lake City and their equipment blitzed out. All of the background music, the guitars, and everything completely gone and he kept on singing on his own because his mic was working none of the other mics were working and when the music came back on maybe i don't know 30 seconds later everything in perfect tune everything the, the right tempo the guy is uh the guy is extraordinary no he's a pro and as they say in the music business he has hits that means five hundred thousand. You, know, you can get paul revere in the raiders generation three <laughs> for right. 20 grand that's right he has hits i remember we're both from michigan and there was always a conspiracy in Michigan to try to drag you over there to run, but you never, you never took any of that bait. You pretty much stayed in Massachusetts, but you did grow up around this stuff. So you knew what it looked like. And you must have been interested as a kid watching your dad. Because see, people who are not from Michigan don't really know the story of your father, who was kind right, of one of right. the first real rock star Republican candidates. He would campaign by jumping fences from house to house. <laughs> he had been a business guy, ran American Motors. He saw the small car coming before anybody else did. That had to be in your head somewhere, though, just because you'd seen it and lived it, the ups and the downs. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would have ever imagined getting involved in politics had I not seen my dad do it first. Because had I just seen him in the business world and then I was in business, it wouldn't have crossed my mind to get involved in something that was so foreign to the private sector. But I had seen him go from being head of a car company to running for governor, and then he won three times. I worked in his campaigns. First campaign, I visited, I believe, 83 counties, a little minivan, a little Ford Econoline van where I'd set up a booth at a county fair and hand up bumper stickers and talk to people about why they should vote for George Romney. So I saw politics and recognized it's not as foreign as, uh, as I might have otherwise imagined. You would have at least a familiarity with kind of the rhythms and music of it, I think. It's a different language. Speaking to a political audience is very different than speaking at a, at a business meeting or speaking at at a church meeting, for instance. Well, at least my church meetings. There are some church meetings that are perhaps more like politics than mine, but uh, ours is kind of a Protestant uh, style meeting where things are pretty staid. And uh, in politics, it's all one liners and belt it out and show a lot of energy. It's a very different thing. And I'd watch my dad do that. I mean, my dad was the person who you really have to acknowledge as a role setting person in America because born in Mexico, had to escape during a revolution in, in Mexico, lived in public housing in El Paso. His dad went broke multiple times, doesn't even graduate from college because he couldn't put the money and time together to do that, became head of a car company, and then became a governor, actually ran for president. I mean, it's extraordinary. And yeah, I, no, it's a legendary tale in Michigan. Yeah, you know, we yeah. all know it there. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the future. We're in a bumpy election right now. So I think a question people aren't talking enough about is whatever happens in this election, and I, I think sadly at the top of the ticket we're going to get clobbered, we got a party to rebuild here. Because if Hillary Rodham Clinton is the next president of the United States, potentially with Vice President Elizabeth Warren, I think we're going to come to an inflection point. We have to decide what conservatism is and build a party that can win a general election and what I think will prove to be pretty short four years. 
What do you think about that? What do you think about the just the intellectual ideas battle to build a new party that's more competitive? Because I, I like to remind people, as painful as it is, we lost the popular vote in five of the last six presidential elections. We're the party of the market. We believe there's wisdom there, and the market keeps telling us no thank you at the presidential level. So I think we need to listen to that and look at how we do some things. What's your take on the, on the future of the party, regardless of whatever we're in the middle of now? Well, I think your question really has to be asked of both parties. And I say that because the Democratic Party just had a potential nominee at Bernie Sanders, who was an extraordinary departure from traditional Democratic thought, very different than the the Bill Clinton of the, the new Democratic Party. This is a guy who's a socialist, who was a effectively a backbencher in the Senate for a long, long, long time, and yet he almost became the nominee. And what does that say about where the Democratic Party is headed? What are they going to be? You know, Hillary Clinton is is someone who I think many went to reluctantly and had there been a, a number of choices in their process like there was in our process, I'm not sure what she would have become the nominee. It might have been Bernie Sanders. So they've got some real issues. And I think in the case of our party, we have to decide, are we going to be a populist party? Are we going to pull back to more traditional conservative thinking? My own view to answer that question is that we have to say to ourselves, what's right for the people of America? Start there. What do we believe is the right thing to improve the prosperity and safety of the great majority of people in America, I mean the middle class of America, and what would help people come out of poverty. And you decide what those things are, and then you go to the public and express why your positions are right to help them. So for me, it's not trying to divine how can we cobble together a group of disparate people to give us the majority, it's instead saying, what's right for America, and then going out and selling that. No, I agree with that. I just think we have to get beyond grievance politics. I got cornered by some Sanders people at an airport, and I asked him about corporate profits. I said, you think there's a room where a guy in a top hat with a mustache is shoveling gold bars? That's where they keep all the profits. Yeah, yeah, that's how it works. You know. <laughs> and so I did the Republican thing, which I started talking about accounting terminology. Well, there's CapEx and shareholder, and they just looked at me like I was Jupiter. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, I do remember asking my colleagues in the legislature in Massachusetts, about profits, because we were talking about whether we would look at a for-profit prison company to manage our state prisons. And they said, well, the for-profit company can't possibly compete with us. There'll be higher costs. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, because they have to earn a profit and we don't. And I said, I don't think you understand what the profit incentive is meant to do. It's meant to get people to find ways to do a better job for lower cost. That's why companies that earn a profit tend to do better than government. And uh, I think that came as a, a surprise to folks. I also said, where do you think profits go? Right, I said, that's do you think, my thing, yeah. Yeah, I said, where, where do you think it goes? Do you think it goes to paying these guys these big bonuses you hear about? They said, yeah, that's where profits go. And I said, actually, that's not where profits go. Profit is what's left after they've paid all those bonuses. Profit is what's left after all that money's been paid. Profit it does two things. One, it goes back to shareholders, which includes all your 401ks and retirement accounts. But most of profit goes to build the business, build new factories. But then the eyes glaze. This is like corporations are people. Right, right. You're right. Yeah, right. You know, legally, you're right. Yeah. But yeah. they look at you like, no, there's a room with the gold bars. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, and, it's very frustrating. You would hope that you'd see enterprises so profitable that they can keep growing and therefore hire more people. And if more people are hired, right. they have to pay people more money because of competition to hire those good people. That is the only way to get real wages up. And by the way, I don't oppose raising the minimum wage. I think in my own view, it ought to be linked with the CPI yeah. and it ought to just be raised gradually over time. But just raising the minimum wage is not going to give people, if you will, more to spend because the prices of things will go up by this amount you're raising their right, wages. Right. So you know, I'd like to do something more than that. And that's why I talk about the policies I do. From your travels in politics, what percent of elected officials, both parties, do you think could pass Economics 101 basic college level exam if they took it tomorrow? Mike, I can't tell you from Congress because I didn't work in Washington, but I can say at the You've state- You've met some congressmen. Yeah. It, it, most, most people who have spent their life either as lawyers or in other professions that don't involve for-profit enterprises, don't understand how companies work and what, what happens with, uh, with profits. And they don't understand, for instance, how a company that's profitable can go bankrupt, right? Anybody who's been in business understands it's very easy to be profitable and go bankrupt. And people don't understand there's a difference between cash and cash flow versus accounting profit right. and taxable income. All these things are very confusing to a lot of people, understandably. But someone who's been in the business world understands that. 
And someone who's been in the business world understands that if you really want to help people in the middle class, you want more enterprises to be successful. So they hire more people and they have to compete to hire those people and they give them more money to get them. That's the key. That's what it's all about. We used to have a culture, though, where people would trust experts to know something and think if they got elected to office, they'd have some good faith to be able to enact it. Now it's just a game of outcomes. We have this weird thing where pop culture has taken over politics now. One of my great Trump painfully ironic observations is I am told that where the apprentice set was in Trump Tower, he had some dead space, probably an asbestos problem, my theory. But anyway, he had space and that's where they put the production. So they had the plywood set to look like a board meeting where he would quote unquote fire celebrities who were paid to pretend to be fired by him in a product placement show. After the show went away, they took the set out. And in that same space, they built the set of the campaign. (laughs) Yeah, it's a laugh or cry thing. Yeah, yeah. You have to give Donald Trump credit. He was able to bring a rhetoric and a style that he had perfected over his career to the political sphere and connect with people and become the nominee, despite the fact that I and a lot of other people thought he would not be an ideal nominee. Uh, He is. At this stage, it's rougher going. But I can't predict what's going to happen. To be honest, it's very possible in my view that Trump wins. I wouldn't think he'd win by a landslide, but I think he could win. I think he could lose. I think he could lose by a landslide, but I don't know which it's going to be. And a lot of that depends on what happens to Hillary Clinton. Is there some meltdown moment or some implosion of some kind? You know, I haven't got new things to say about Donald Trump. I believe what I've said about him in the past. And he may be able to paper over what he believes and what he is and change his positions to present a more palatable figure to the electorate. But I think he's revealed who he is by what he said during the primary process. So given all that, what are you planning to do in November in that ballot booth? Well, I'm not going to be voting for Donald Trump, and I'm not going to be voting for Hillary Clinton. I will be looking at the other people who are running and seeing if there's one of them I can support. And if not, I'll write in the name of another Republican. I'm working on write-in scenarios. And here's my current one. I'm going to think this all the way through. I'm going to look for a business guy who came out of nowhere to win the nomination and then during the campaign put the country first at a time of overseas threat and danger. Wendell Wilkie. <laughs> I'm going to write in the ghost of Wendell Wilkie because people forgot that in the campaign against FDR where he was ahead, he took a pretty tough position on the draft, which gave Roosevelt cover to be for the draft, the issue that was killing Roosevelt because they both wanted to be ready for Hitler. And that's so something. that's my kind of business outsider in the Republican Party. But if this thing gives us a ton of downloads, you may get my write-in vote. So I'm I'm open for business here. Yeah, you vote for me, I'll vote for you. (laughs) There we go. You're the only vote I get. I think you might have a couple. Jeb could have a couple too. And he's in the same place where you are. He won't support Trump. I think after this is over, I'm hoping for show trials because very few people have had the courage on this. And I commend you for that. And I think more people are going to wish they'd said that now. Looking forward, who do you think runs in four years? I think Ryan's a possibility. I think if Marco gets back in the Senate, he could be a possibility. You got Ben Sass. What? Yeah, I think Ben Sass could be a candidate as well. I think he's a very impressive guy. Tom Cotton, senator from Arkansas, very impressive guy. We've got a, we've got a very deep bench. I mean, a remarkable thing about our party, I think, is that we have a, a lot of folks that are capable, well-spoken, solid individuals that could credibly be our nominee or potentially the president. And I think, by the way, a number of the people who ran in in 2016 will consider running again. Ted Cruz, I wouldn't write him off. I think Ted Cruz will be back. Perhaps Marco. I don't know whether Marco has the bug to run for president again. Perhaps he does. He's going to have more of a fight in that Senate race, I think, than people expect. But he's the most formidable guy we had. So I'm glad he's running. But, you know, if he wins that, I think he'll be back in consideration. Well, he's got a challenge in Florida because apparently Donald Trump isn't doing real well in Florida. And Marco has said he will support him. And that's going to be obviously used against him in that race. I don't know how big of an issue that'll be for him there. He's running against a Murphy, which is always difficult. But this Murphy's pretty bad. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no relation to you. No, no, I'll make that very clear. No relation at all. You think Paul Ryan's going to run? We didn't really talk about him. Likes his job that he has. I don't know if Paul Ryan will run. I wanted him to run in 2016. Probably a good thing he didn't. Yeah, uh, because it just wasn't the year for you know an idea-driven person, and he's been extraordinarily valuable in the House. So I'm glad he is where he is, and and it's important for him to be there, whether Donald Trump becomes president or Hillary Clinton becomes president. I mean, th- this is a critical guy, so I'm kind of glad he is where he is. But I was trying to convince him to run. Um, 
Will he run in 2020? Uh, depends on who all gets on the stage. And I don't know that he has the bug uh, to, to run for president. I mean, he's a guy who's driven by policy and yeah. ideas. And his, his unique skill is not only sorting through complicated issues and coming up with, with answers, but it's getting other people to come on board. I don't think anyone imagined he'd be able to get 247 Republican congressmen and women to come together on six policy areas and agree. Yeah, no, he's done great. And he holds the torch. He's kind of the defender of what we, a torch we cannot let extinguish in the party. Though I'm worried because if the orange plague, you know, costs us some house seats, he'll be, he could be down to an eight or nine margin. And then elements in his caucus are going to be particularly hard to deal with, but he seems to have the skills. So I'm pulling for him. Yeah. I pull for Paul. And, uh, and what I'm doing is raising money for team Ryan and also raising money for something that the Chamber of Commerce has called Save Our Senate, SOS. Um, I, I'm going to be working real hard this season. I won't be helping on the presidential side, but I'll be helping in the Senate and in the House because that's where uh, I think we're going to have the guidance and leadership from our party. Yeah, I think there's some hope there because even though generically, if Trump really takes a flyer down, he has enough of his own identity as kind of an outlier, not really a Republican, kind of a reality show, you know, reject in my view, that the Republican senators might be able to buck the historical trend and have their own identity as a counterbalance to the Democrats. So I'm a little more optimistic than most people about even if we have trouble at the top, it's a noble effort to fight on the Senate side. And that's where I'm doing most of my political work, too. Um, I've got one more question for you. This convention is going to be something else. Are you going to it? Are you going to Cleveland? Or are you going to, you're going to, you got dental surgery that week. I'm not going to Cleveland. I'm going to be with my grandkids at Lake Winnipesaukee. But I'll bet if you were to paddle a canoe close, there might be muted screams coming from behind the glass in your house there um, as you watch it. You're, you're going to watch this thing. Oh, sure. It. I'm yeah. going to watch. Conventions are, are obviously extraordinary entertainment, uh, but entertainment with purpose and, and significance. And so I'll be watching. We could have an interesting thing in four years because it could be a big generational change in the party and some fresh faces. But let me let me do the scenario. We are not too far from San Clemente. The party's in rubble post-Trump. We crawl back in the upcoming midterms and maybe recover some things we lost in 2016 and 2018. And the party is looking for somebody who's tested, proven, tan, ready. What about you? I think you're the first person who has suggested that idea, Mike. So you literally are in a, in a, in a field of one. And uh, I can assure you that's not something on my mind. We got a deep bench of people who are ready to go. I think you could have a hell of a slogan. Mitt Romney, hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> Proven in hindsight. Proven in hindsight, right. <laughs> the rearview mirrors never look better. Um, I don't know. I think there could be a little buzz. You never know who these guys will drop off. Rubio loses a Senate race. Sass is Nebraska, no base for money. I don't know. I'm just saying. I, 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 I do have to tell you that watching 2016 and watching the debates, and I watched every debate. You, you must have been undercard, just totally. The undercard debates, the top billing debate, I watched them all. It was very difficult. I thought, by the way, a number of people did real well. I, I'd write John Kasich and Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. and I mean, I'd write notes afterwards to these guys. I thought they did real well. But I thought that Donald Trump needed to be taken down several pegs. And I didn't think he got the level of scrutiny in those debates and in the campaigns that would normally be given to a front runner. I think most people thought, and by the way, I was one of them, I thought he would disappear. So people trained their guns elsewhere. I thought Cruz would get him. I thought it would come down to Cruz would chew him up because ideologically Trump's a Democrat or he's a whatever he wants to be at the moment. But I thought Cruz would unite that kind of grievance base vote in the party. And then it would be a fight between us, Jeb, Marco, and a few others, Kasich, for Christie perhaps, for the other thing. What was interesting about Trump and the numbers was he was pulling from everybody. He was doing very well over on the grievance side, but he was pulling some regular Republicans too, just on that persona. So at first it was 20, 24 percent. It was, they were forehand. It was very hard to peel them off. And if you did, they mostly went over to Cruz, at least in the theoretical polling. And then it started getting bigger. And of course, you had the feedback loop of the media business giving him constant attention. There, there are studies out there that say he had seven times more attention on free television than anybody else. Yeah, yeah. I saw a pie chart that showed that he had more than all the other candidates combined. And part of that was driven by him. I mean, he was the master at doing things that got him TV coverage. Yeah, well, he gave him conflict, which is what they want. Exactly, exactly. And he would say things that were unexpected. 
and that would draw a lot of response from other people. And he was there day in and day out. He was the beneficiary, rather, of the fact that there were 14 other people or whatever yeah, running yeah, against absolutely. him. And had it been two people from the beginning, whether it would have been Cruz or Jeb or Marco or Chris Christie, it might have been a different outcome. But that's not the way it was. Yeah. You know, you take what comes and it was a an ideal setting for him and he was successful going through it. You got to give him credit for that. I still think he loses. And I think it's about a 10% chance that Trump could ever win purely because of the math. I think, yes, he won the primaries, but he did so with less than half the vote, maybe 13 million ish out of 28 million. And now we're in a general election with 128 million people in it. And the new 100 million are not cranky old white guys like you and me. And they tend not to like Trump. If you look at the votes that you need, college-educated white women, Latinos, where you don't, you don't have to have a majority, but you have to do a lot better. You College-educated white men, women, you have to win them. Trump right now is well underwater, and I don't see how being Trump he gets out of it. And I don't think Trump can change what Trump is. I think he doubles down on kind of the insult comic thing. And you never want to say never in a year where everybody's as angry and upset as this year. But he... He's not showing any life among the groups that have to radically change their opinion about him. So we're seeing. And I can argue with you. I don't know that I have the expertise that you do in looking at each of those groups and the demographics and the impact of that. But you can't forget Hillary Clinton is a player as well. And she's an awful candidate. People don't trust her. They don't like her. In my view, she comes across as not being at all authentic. And I don't understand why it is she can't be what I would have expected her to be, which is Angela Merkel. She's got the wardrobe, but boom, now I'll get mail. <laughs> or Catherine Sebelius. I mean, there are people who are serious yeah. women leaders that don't go into an audience and put their arms up in the air and make a big guffaw kind of smile. And it's almost like she's acting like she's Bill Clinton and she's not Bill Clinton. And right. I, nonetheless, it doesn't come across well. Less would be more with her. She's got to learn that lesson. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to give her advice, but <laughs> but I, I think she's a really challenged candidate and the unfavorable support numbers that she has that suggests that it is not going well for her. And so she could lose this. I mean, right now, Donald Trump has momentum, but he's facing some tough headwinds. But Hillary Clinton is also facing headwinds. Oh, yeah. They're both massively unpopular. That's why it's so hard to determine exactly what's going to happen in this race. She just has that generic advantage of the playing field is friendlier to her. So she, Trump has to get much better. She has to get a little better. And believe me, I'm not excited about it. What I always say about Hillary Clinton is, uh, the analogy I use is, have you ever had Dasani bottled water? And if I'm like in an audience, people will nod like you're doing and mm-hmm. say, yeah, I've, yeah, I've had it. And yeah. I go, we can all admit among friends, it's pretty crappy bottled water. I like it, but you, go ahead. <laughs> you just ruined my whole shit here. Sorry, go all ahead. All right, so anyway, as I was saying, it's pretty crappy bottled water. And people laugh and kind of nod. And I say, but you drank a lot of it because of the Coca-Cola company's distribution. You can't escape the stuff. It's in every 7-Eleven. It's in every drive through window at every hotel mini bar. You see a lot of Dasani water. She is Dasani water. And so the distribution of being the Democrat, the only non-Trump water on the shelf, even with all her problems, may indeed be enough to win the election. I think a lot of people would say that the challenge for our party and my challenge as our nominee was that I was unable to communicate effectively to middle income and poor Americans of whatever race that I was for them. And the reason I was running was to help them. And I'm not sure we'll be able to shake that image in this 2016 campaign either. And if we don't, why, I think it's very hard to win. She, for all her weaknesses, is sober and known, while Trump is dangerous and wild. And Trump acts dangerous and wild every day, so he does nothing to undo that. With these two candidates and with what's going on in the world today, so much could happen between now and November. I think it's very hard to predict what the outcome will be. If people want to follow you, a Twitter handle, a website, you're selling merch, appearing at auto shows. I, no one wants any, to follow me. <laughs> no, you <laughs> but underestimate. I'm a, but I'm on Facebook and Twitter. And, uh, What's and so your they Twitter can, handle? Uh, you know, at Mitt Romney. Okay, Mitt, here now is the mega question. If you knew your vote decided the election. Uh, <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> I write in my own name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the old political chops aren't gone. Aren't gone. Fight for sanity. Sanity in this crazy year on Radio Free GOP. Well, that's our interview of Mitt Romney. Boy, he knows how to dodge a mega question, doesn't he? Still has the chops. Ah, I wish he were the candidate. I wish Jeb were the candidate. I wish somebody I wasn't so ashamed of was the candidate. But here we are. And with that, we're going to end episode two of the Radio Free GOP podcast from our undisclosed location. Remember, you can send us a message on the Twitter at Radio Free GOP, or follow me 
at Murphy Mike. And there's always email, comment at RadioFreeGOP.com and check out our website, check out our merch. And oh, there it is, the Thought Police, once again, hot on our trail here in the undisclosed location. Time to pack up the podcasting gear and head to the great American Midwest. Next stop, Cleveland. Until then, remember, victory will be ours. <laughs>